Uh, Madam Speaker, speaking to the bill. Delegate Carter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, with respect to uh, the chairman, uh, she and I have gone back and forth on this in finance committee. Um, I do not believe this to be a good bill. Uh, so the current state of affairs, when, when you're dealing with these third-party settlement organizations, you're talking about companies like Uber and Lyft. And what we're talking about are people who make less than $20,000 per year from these companies that are being told by the company uh, that no tax documentation is required. Now, I understand uh, that there, there is a need to increase compliance with this, but uh, I believe that this is fundamentally the wrong way to be going about this. We've got people who drive for Uber and Lyft that are, in some cases, sleeping out in airport parking lots that are struggling to get by, and this bill is estimated to bring in an additional $30 million per year in revenue from those people who have the least ability to pay. Madam Speaker, uh, I would say to you and to the members of this body, while I do understand the need for increased compliance, I think that the way to go about this uh, is to come back next year and make those folks, including me, W-2 employees of the companies, rather than uh, trying to paint them as tax cheats and talk about leveling the playing field uh, between them and employees. These folks are already at a severe disadvantage. They have no workplace protections whatsoever. Uh, they're expected to provide their own vehicle. They're on the hook for all the maintenance costs. Madam Speaker, I think this is fundamentally a flawed way to go about this, and I urge the body to reject this bill. Thank you. Delegate from Fairfax. Delegate Watts. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Speaking to the bill. Delegate Watts, you have the floor. I want to clarify uh, two things uh, in what was just presented. Again, it is a matter of reporting to the employees and to tax what the payments have been. It is then the progressivity of the tax code that addresses whether or not someone who's making uh, less than 40000 less than 50000 uh, adjusted gross, less than 30000 adjusted gross, would in fact owe any tax. And what we would see is in the vast majority of cases, there would be no tax owed. So simply reporting a tax is not to be confused with whether or not the individual would in fact pay a tax. Uh, with that clarification, I believe that, again, I would urge the body to engross the bill and pass it on to its third reading. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. The bill is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. House Bill 886, a bill to amend and reenact Section 10.1204.1 of the Code of Virginia and to repeal the Second Enactment Clause of Chapter 461 of the Acts of Assembly of 2015 relating to the State Trails Advisory Committee, Sunset, reported from Agriculture, Chesapeake, and Natural Resources. The delegate from Fairfax, Delegate Plum. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker and ladies and gentlemen of the House, we are a commonwealth of great natural beauty and historic resources. Many of these amenities are accessible to us through the trails that have been developed by volunteers. House Bill 886 extends the sunset for this activity January 2027. Hope it be the pleasure of the House to engross the bill and pass it to its third reading. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? The bill is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. House Bill 980, a bill to amend and reenact Section 16.177 and other sections of the Code of Virginia relating to provision of abortion, reported from courts of justice with substitute, and there is a floor substitute. The delegate from Alexandria, Delegate Herring. Madam Speaker, I move the substitute. Shall the committee substitute be agreed to? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? The committee substitute is agreed to. Delegate Herring. Um, Madam Speaker and uh, members of the, the body, I would like to first explain um, the difference between the substitute and what um, was originally introduced. Um, this bill will allow um, advanced practice clinicians that includes uh, trained and qualified physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, and trained and certified nurse uh, midwives to um, exercise in their scope of practice and provide first trimester abortions. This bill does contain an informed written consent provision, but the, the bill is introduced uh, by drafting error left out that that informed written consent had to be obtained uh, by those advanced practice clinicians. Um, and Madam Speaker, I will then go on to continue and explain the bill. <clears throat> 
the bill, again, retains informed written consent, but the bill does remove from the code the 24-hour waiting period um, that has been provided uh, for in, in recent past. The simple fact is, is that the 24-hour waiting period acts as a bar for a woman to have an abortion. It is not medically evidence-based. Providers can date a pregnancy through various methods, including a pelvic exam or a review of the uh, last menstrual cycle. The bill does not prevent a pr practitioner pr from providing a, an ultrasound but the bill does remove the 24-hour requirement. And Madam Speaker and members of this as body, I would submit to you that at not all times are ultrasounds actually appropriate. But by requiring the 24-hour waiting period, we are forcing someone who is seeking an abortion to first visit the doctor, go away, and then come back. And why I say it's not ever required by medical practice or evidence based is because in the bill or actually in the law right now we have an exemption for someone who lives a hundred miles away. The standard of care is to have an ultrasound performed at the close in time as abortion as possible. In other words, the same day. It is should be up to the physician and the woman who is visiting her doctor. Certainly women have the right to know what is going on with their bodies. The bill will not prevent women who want to have an ultrasound from receiving one. It will let the women know what is happening on their first visit. The consent provisions are pro that are part of our current law have been removed. You will again note that informed written consent is still required, but what we have currently is biased language in our law. And I say, Madam Speaker, that it is biased because it does not take into account how a patient presents to the doctor. A woman may have decided that she wants an abortion and her physician does provide information. They talk about options. They talk about carrying the pregnancy to term. They talk about adoption. And they talk about abortion and the different methods of abortion in the first trimester. But what we have here in our law would force a woman to undergo something that is prescribed by legislators that not, may not be appropriate given that situation that that uh, woman is in when consulting with her physician or if this bill passes the advanced practice clinician. The bill also removes what's known as the targeted regulation against abortion providers. If some of you were here probably and you remember in 2011, um, on a bill dealing with nursing homes and hospitals, an amendment was put on requiring that we um, as a state adopt regulations uh, for clinics who provided five or more first trimester abortions and classifying them as hospitals. Then what the state did was use codes and regulations intended for new construction for hospitals and require them for the clinics. This is now removed, and my bill will remove that regulation. And I don't want you all to be sort of uh, frightened by this, and I'll tell you why. Any facility in Virginia that provides abortions are regulated by the Department of Health Professions. The clinicians, the practitioners operating within are also regulated. And I may add that oftentimes, um, I mean, these, they're, they're, I'm sorry, Madam Speaker, they are regulated, and so there's no need for the regulation. Um, the clinics will continue to be subject to the same oversight and regulations as other physicians and they are regulated again by the VDHP through the Boards of Medicine and Nursing to track regulations single out providers making them subject to both the Virginia Department of Health pra uh, for Virginia Department of Health practitioners and the VDH without any medical basis. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. 
Yes, uh, uh, Delegate I'm, I'm not sure if it's parliamentary inquiry or what it is, but I didn't know if the speaker was aware that our live streaming is not happening. Is it, is it actually being live streamed? The clerks are looking into it. Well, Madam Speaker? Yes, I, I would ask that until we find out if we could suspend the testimony, please. The House will be at ease. The House will come to order. The live stream is working. The clerk shall report a floor amendment. Floor, more, floor amendment to House Bill 980 by Delegate Gilbert is available on your desks. You should each have a hard copy at your desks of the floor amendment. Delegate from Fairfax, Delegate Simon. Madam Speaker, point of order. Delegate Simon, you have the floor. Uh, Madam Speaker, the amendment that has been distributed is at our desks uh, creates a new act within this statute that's not in the title. It goes well beyond the scope of the original legislation and is not germane to the underlying bill. The House will be at ease.
The House will come to order. I find that the amendment is not germane. Madam Speaker. Delegate from Shenandoah, Delegate Gilbert. Parliamentary inquiry. Delegate Gilbert, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the um, amendment was titled Born Alive Protection Act uh, to effectively protect uh, those children that are born alive as a result of a, uh, a, an abortion uh, gone awry or botched or um, whatever circumstances uh, ultimately lead to that situation, Madam Speaker, and the title of the bill uh, says um, a bill to amend and reenact various code sections of the Code of Virginia relating to the provision of abortion. Uh, since uh, we know now uh, quite well here in Virginia that children born alive uh, are naturally yes, yes, delegate point point Fairfax, speaker, delegate the, Simon. The rulings of the of the of the speaker are not uh, debatable, and so I, I wonder if. Um, this is out of order, and if again, if the gentleman would like to challenge the ruling of the chair, I'm sure we can put that on that's the board. Right. But I don't know Delegate this is appropriate line of question. That's correct. Delegate Gilbert, I made my ruling. The amendment is not germane. Madam Speaker. Yes, Delegate uh, Shenandoah, Delegate Gilbert. I appreciate that, and and uh, as we are trying to do parliamentary procedure correctly here, I assume I was making a parliamentary inquiry for the gentleman's edification. Uh, but I thank the speaker, Madam Speaker. I believe I have a second amendment at the desk. The clerk shall report the amendment. Floor amendment by, offered by Delegate Gilbert to House Bill 980. After line 79, committee substitute insert section 18.2, 74.5, compensation for fetal tissue prohibited penalty. As a condition of licensure to perform abortion services, it shall be unlawful for for one, any physician licensed by the Board of Medicine to practice medicine and surgery. Two, any person licensed by the Board of Medicine as a physician assistant and acting within his scope of practice. Three, any person jointly licensed by the Boards of Medicine and Nursing as a nurse practitioner or certified nurse midwife and acting within his scope of practice or four, any other person or provider or other entity to sell or exchange for consideration of anything of value, any fetal tissue remains or other products of an abortion procedure or to be reimbursed for any costs involved in the collection, transport, storage, implantation, processing, or preservation of the same. Violation of this section shall also constitute a class one misdemeanor. The delegate from Fairfax, Delegate Simon. Point of order, Madam Speaker. Delegate Simon. Madam Speaker, this amendment, again, attempts to change the purpose of the bill, expand the scope unnecessarily, and is not germane to the bill, underlying bill. Yes, the chair, the chair rules, Speaker rules that this is not germane. Madam Chair, Madam Speaker. Yes, apologize. Delegate from Shenandoah, Delegate uh, Gilbert. We have a long um, history of rulings of the Speaker on germaneness. Would the Speaker articulate... Uh, why this is not germane, again, given the fact that this bill says relating to the provision of abortion and covers any number of areas that the gentlewoman from Alexandria just described, uh, a vast array of areas in Delegate this, Gilbert, in, I've made my ruling. I, I would ask the, the speaker to explain for posterity so that we can rely on that in the future, Madam Delegate Speaker. Delegate Gilbert, I made my ruling. The speaker has ruled that the floor amendment is not germane. All those in favor? Oh, Delegate, Madam, delegate Madam, Herring? Madam Speaker. Delegate Gilbert. Will the delegate yield for a question? Will the delegate yield? I yield. The delegate will yield. Uh, thank you to the uh, gentlewoman, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I would ask the gentlewoman, um, we hear the refrain in this debate, which is obviously very divisive, uh, we hear the refrain constantly that this issue is between a woman and her doctor. And the gentlewoman just articulated that herself in her remarks, that it should be up to a physician and the patient or, or something uh, akin to that. Um, I would ask the gentlewoman, since this now appears to apply well beyond uh, a relationship between a woman and her doctor, a woman and her nurse, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, midwife, uh, under what circumstances will the law delineate where a physician uh, is actually the one involved in this decision with a woman and where it is just merely someone else? Where, where can we find that delineation? Um, 
Uh, th thank you, Delegate. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, I would first thank the Delegate for his question. Um, and I was referring to how the law is written now. Um, and with this amendment, we are talking about nurse practitioners and physicians assistants and clinical midwives. I would submit to the delegate that these individuals are highly trained and qualified. And indeed, Madam Speaker, some of them have to practice under the authority of a physician for a period of time. So it is within the scope of their practice that they are providing these first trimester abortions. And so that conversation is appropriate between one who is trained to provide first trimester abortions and, um, and the patient visiting. Madam, Madam Speaker. Yes, Delegate Gilbert. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Will the delegate yield for another question? Will the delegate yield? I yield. The delegate will yield. Thank you, Madam Speaker. But I, I understand the term scope of practice, but this law does not appear to limits when someone other than a physician can perform any any kind of abortion and can the delegate explain to us where those limitations exist in the law otherwise well i would point madam speaker Del i would point delegate. the delegate to title 18.2-72 on line 72 where the reference is to first trimester uh pregnancy and when an abortion, a lawful abortion is performed there. Um, and that, that this bill deals with the first trimester, trimester abortions. Madam Speaker. Delegate Gilbert. Would the delegate yield for another question? Will the delegate yield? I yield. The delegate will yield. Thank you, Madam delegate Speaker. Delegate Gilbert, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I would ask the delegate again, where is the limitation, though, in, within the context of the first trimester abortion, where is the limitation on the type of abortion procedure that now a nurse practitioner or a midwife can perform? Madam Speaker, I would say again, I thank the delegate for his question because this proves my point. It is those who are licensed in the practice of medicine, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants who have expertise. If he is concerned about the type of abortion, I would inform the delegate that typically in the first trimester, it is done by a two-pill protocol. One that is taken in the physician's clinic, or an actually physician will either offer it, the patient will either take it in front of the doctor, or the patient does not have to. Her privacy is respected. And the second pill is provided, um, and the patient takes it at home. Madam Speaker, will, yes, will, will the delegate yield for another question? Will the delegate yield? I yield. The delegate will yield. Again, Madam Speaker, the, the delegate just used the word physician and the word doctor in the same sentence when describing this scenario, and she also used the word typically. And again, if, if there is a scenario that she's trying to lay out um, about who can do what when and under what circumstances and under what training or licensure or scope of practice or whatever, I would ask the gentlewoman, where is that limitation on what, who can do what in the bill? Madam Speaker, delegate I would say to the delegate that he misheard me because I clearly said physician's assistant, nurse practitioner, and midwives, um, and as well as physicians. So that's the first thing. Number two, this is law. This is code. And I would submit to the delegate that the role of the department of health professions and the boards of medicine and the Virginia Board of Medicine, who, by the way, the Virginia Society uh, of Doctors endorses this bill, the Virginia Medical Association, and they support it. So I would submit that this is my very point. We, as legislators, should not be delineating the, the practice that physicians, nurse practitioners, midwives, all of those that I have mentioned in this bill, we should not be delineated. That is for regulations, that is proper in that scope, it is standards of practice, it is across the street at VCU where our, our students are studying about the practice of medicine. We as legislators should be not doing that. Madam Speaker, delegate will the delegate Gilbert? yield for another question? Will the delegate yield? I yield. The delegate will yield. I appreciate the delegate yielding and um, notwithstanding the fact that this decision no longer appears to be between a woman and her doctor. I would ask the delegate if uh, she, she referred earlier to the fact 
that nothing in this bill would prevent a, f a doctor, I think she said, from um, showing an ultrasound to a woman. Uh, is there anything in this bill that would prevent, and, and, and I would submit to the gentlewoman that the use of, uh, of an ultrasound is standard practice for abortion providers, even a transvaginal uh, ultrasound, that as that is um, standard practice, is there anything in this bill that would prevent a physician from denying a woman the opportunity to see an ultrasound uh, if it is used um, as standard practice? Madam Delegate. Speaker, I first have to state the delegate mischaracterized what I said um, and, and the purpose of this bill. These decisions are indeed between a woman and a doctor, and he can say it however he wants. But again, this bill goes back to the basic principle that this is between a woman and his doctor. When he asked about will it prevent the standard of practice, practice and it will prevent a physician, nurse's assistant, um, nurse practitioner, or midwife from showing an ultrasound or what will happen, I will submit to the delegate that is within the standard of practice to determine whether an ultrasound is even required. And I would tell the delegate by the bill that happened and what we did in this legislature in 2012, it's grave. Because he does not understand, and I, I'm sorry, Delegate, and you are a friend, but the problem with what the, the way the law stands now is that a woman who has experienced sexual assault may indeed have to go through a forced transvaginal ultrasound. This law will free a physician to consult, a physician, nurse's assistant, well, let's just use it as just say a clinician, so we're not confused. A clinician from cons will allow that clinician to freely consult with the patient and determine how that patient presents and determine whether indeed an ultrasound is even appropriate. And as I said earlier, it is within the scope of practice, their education and training to determine what is the best way to determine gestational age. Again, I leave it to the clinicians and the woman. That's where it should be, not we as legislators forcing some sort of procedure. Madam Speaker, and I, I apologize. I think the delegate was consulting with her colleague when I finally got to the heart of my question, so I'll, I'll do it a little differently if she will yield again. I'm oh, not wait. sure if the delegate is going to yield, but that's up to the delegate. Yep. Delegate Herring. Ma Madam Speaker, and I, I, it's very unfortunate that the delegate is characterizing, I didn't consult with anyone. I am standing here on my own with no consultation. So let's be clear. I, just, I was just suggesting that she didn't hear my question, Madam Speaker. That's all. All right. No insult delegate was Gilbert. meant by it. Delegate Herring. Would you, if, would you if like to If the delegate to wants yield? to ask it again, I'd be happy to answer it. The delegate it will again. yield. Thank you, delegate Madam Speaker. Gilbert. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The, the question was, since ultrasound is um, a, a standard practice in the performing of abortions, and the delegate said that nothing would prevent a provider, a physician, whomever, from showing the ultrasound to the woman, my question was, would there, is there anything in the bill that would prevent a physician from denying a woman the opportunity if she requests it? In other words, oh, you're doing an ultrasound. May I see what you're doing? Is there anything in here that would prevent a physician from saying, no, you can't see it? I would delegate answer her. the delegate that within these four, these corners of my bill, no, but I would also say this. If a, if a patient asks a clinician to see an ultrasound, that clinician would be violating their standards of practice and actually committing perhaps malpractice for not providing patient medical information. Delegate from Ma Richmond City, Delegate. Madam Speaker. Delegate McQuinn. Madam Speaker. Uh, delegate from Richmond City, Delegate McQuinn. Inquiry. Do I have the floor? Ma Madam Chair. I believe yes. I still have the floor, Madam Speaker. Delegate Gilbert. I move the pending question, Madam Chair. Madam Speaker. Madam Again. Speaker. Parliamentary yes. Inquiry. I, yes, Delegate I, Gilbert. The, the, the Chair recognized me um, to ask a question, and I have not given up the floor yet. Delegate Gilbert. 
Do you have another question? I do. Not if sure the delegate, delegate's we, I'm, going I'm to I'm not sure she'll take the hand either, but, but you know, I'll take one more question. The delegate will speaker. yield one thank, more question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Delegate McQuinn. Um, is the delegate aware, I would ask her, um, of the case of Falls Church Medical Center versus Oliver, where Dr. Mark Nichols, an abortionist, said that he in fact does deny women the right to see their ultrasound despite their request because he knows what's best for them. I would ask if she is aware of that case. Madam Speaker, I would respond to the delegate that I am aware of the case, but I'm also aware of the court saying that the waiting period and ultrasound requirements of the state of Virginia. Are part of our decision as a legislature. That is our decision on matter of policy. I do not care to comment on the testimony of a physician. I was not there, but I am very aware of the case. I thank the gentlewoman. Shall thank the bill you. be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. The, the bill is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. Sergeant at Arms. Madam Speaker, a message from the Senate. Senator Locke. Senator McClellan. Madam Speaker, I have been directed by the President of the Senate to inform the House of Delegates that the Senate has agreed to House Joint Resolution 1. House will come to order. House Bill 999, a bill to amend and reenact Section 22.1274.2 of the Code of Virginia relating to school board policies, epinephrine accessibility. Reported from Education. Delegate from Albemarle, Delegate Bell. Mr. Speaker, I'm, am I mistaken that there was either a substitute or a committee amendment? I do not believe so. Okay. All right. Madam Speaker, members of the House, uh, many of this body are familiar with, well, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, Madam Speaker, can I go by temporarily? I want to make sure I'm speaking to the right bill. Yes. HB 999 will go by temporarily. House Bill 1071, a bill to amend and reenact Section 18.2388 of the Code of Virginia relating to profane swearing in public. Reported from Courts of Justice. Delegate from Richmond City, Delegate Adams. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, House Bill 1071 is a bill to remove profane swearing from the, um, in public from the criminal code. This is currently a class four misdemeanor, uh, and I would like to thank my colleague, uh, Delegate Webert, for all his hard work uh, to address this problem over the years. I hope it will be uh, the pleasure of the body to engross the bill and pass it on to its third reading. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed? The bill is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. House Bill 1073, a bill to amend the Code of Virginia by adding a section number 22.1273.3 relating to parental educational information, tobacco and nicotine vapor products, reported from education. The delegate from Fairfax, Delegate Corey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. HB 1073 amends the code to require educational information about tobacco and nicotine va vapor products to be sent annually to every family in a school board's purview. The um, actual bill says that the information needs to contain information about the health dangers of tobacco and nicotine vapor and that the information will be consistent with guidelines set forth in the Department of Education. Um, Madam Speaker, I would like to just mention that it's, this is, has a very,
very low fiscal impact. It's about $9,000, which is what the Department of Education believes it will take for them to develop an online module uh, advising parents of the damage that can be done to a developing brain by nicotine, whether it's through cigarettes or vaping. I hope it is the pleasure of the body to advance this bill to the third reading. Thank Shall you. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, the bill is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. House Bill 1272, a bill to amend and reenact Section 29.1302.1 of the Code of Virginia relating to senior resident lifetime license for hunting bear, deer, and turkey. Reported from Agriculture, Chesapeake, and Natural Resources with amendment. The delegate from Chesterfield, Delegate Robinson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the committee amendment. Shall the committee amendment be agreed to? All those in favor, say aye. All those opposed, the committee amendment is agreed to. Delegate Robinson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. HB 1272 directs the Board of Game and Inland Fisheries to provide a senior resident lifetime hunting license that one shall include both a basic hunting license, a special deer, bear, and turkey license. It will be available only to residents of the Commonwealth who are 80 years of age or older, and it will be at the cost of $200. I ask the body to engross the bill and pass it on to the third reading. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor say aye. Those opposed? The bill is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. House Bill 1307, a bill to amend and reenact Section 29.1504 of the Code of Virginia relating to hunting laws, novice booklet, reported from Agriculture, Chesapeake, and Natural Resources with substitute. The delegate from Lynchburg, Delegate Walker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. House Bill 1307 simply aims to educate novice hunters in ways of the craft by way of an application uh, on the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries app. I hope that this uh, will be the will of the uh, body to engross this bill and pass it on to this reading. I had delegate uh, uh, from Campbell County in mind when I was thinking of this bill. Thank you, Madam Shall the committee substitute be Madam Speaker, to? Madam Speaker, over here in the corner. Yes, Delegate Jones. Uh, will the delegate yield for a series of questions? Will the delegate yes. yield? <laughs> yes, the delegate will yield. Delegate Thank you, Madam Jones. Speaker. I would ask the delegate, uh, can he define novice, or is this defined anywhere in this bill? Novice delegate is... Delegate Walker. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Novice is somebody learning, getting started in hunting. Generally, this deals with younger people. And currently, right now, the game inland fisheries has regulations as it relates to the fishing and hunting, things like that. So for those that are youth hunters, you know, many 4-H uh, individuals in our schools and things out here, this is just another application since technology is what we use now. This will not incur any additional financial uh, expenses, but it also gives young people the basic ABCs to hunting. Madam Speaker, a follow-up question. Delegate Jones, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Delegate Walker, I would also ask. Madam Speaker. Delegate from Shenandoah, Delegate Gilbert. Just a quick point of order. Wouldn't the um, delegate be required to yield to the question before it is posed? Yes. Will the delegate yield? Will the delegate yield for another question? The delegate will yield for another question. Delegate Thank you. So, uh, Delegate Walker, or I would say to the delegate, um, what is the purpose of this legislation and where did it originate? Uh, and was the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries supportive of this bill? Yes. Yeah, so I actually delegate met. Walker. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, may I respond to the delegate? Yes, delegate. You yes, have I worked with the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. Uh, they went over this bill. They came back with this language. They were acceptable with this right here, that an app would be appropriate to use, uh, incorporating into their regulations, sir. Madam Speaker, speaking yep. of the bill, the appropriate time. Thank you. Delegate Jones. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members of the House, I don't know why this bill struck me, but it caught my eye a little bit, and I have to say, uh, it seems as if. Uh, we're creating more work for the government, and I know that my friends across the aisle might uh, agree with me on this, and I'm not sure that this bill actually serves any real purpose, and so I would encourage the members of the body to uh, deny engrossment of this bill. Thank you. Shall the committee substitute be agreed to? All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed, the committee, su the committee substitute is agreed to. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. The bill is not engrossed 
fails to. All those in favor, raise their right hand. All those opposed, raise your right hand. The bill fails to engross by a vote of 44 to 53. <laughs> shall, shall the bill engross and be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? The clerk shall close the roll. Ayes 43, nays 54, abstentions 0. Ayes 43, nays 54, abstentions 0. The bill fails to engross. House Bill 1357 has gone by for the day. Madam Speaker, I have a Yes, Delegate Fowler. Uh, Madam Speaker, having uh, voted on the prevailing side by which we failed to engross House Bill 1307, make a motion we reconsider the vote by which we failed to uh, engross the bill. Shall the vote by which HB 1307 failed to be engrossed be reconsidered? All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? No. The bill fails to be reconsidered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Madam Speaker. Okay. House Bill 1394 has gone by for the day. House Bill 1413, a bill to amend and reenact Section 58301 of the Code of Virginia relating to conformity of the Commonwealth's taxation system with the Internal Revenue Code, reported from finance with substitute, and there is an emergency clause. Delegate from Fairfax, Delegate Watts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the committee substitute. Shall the committee substitute be agreed to? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed? The committee substitute is agreed to. Delegate Watts. Thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, members of the body. This is the annual uh, conformity bill that allows timely filing of income tax returns for, for the previous calendar year. The committee substitute was necessary uh, given that Congress 
decided after our budget had been uh, prepared on December 20th, after it had been presented on December 18th, to extend the uh, different threshold for medical expenses. And in extending that threshold, there was a serious impact on the budget. So the conformity before you uh, covers all of the other federal changes with the exception of the uh, reversion on the medical uh, expenses. I hope it'll be the pleasure of the body to engross the bill and pass it on to its third reading. Madam so Speaker. Delegate from Shenandoah, Delegate Gilbert. Parliamentary inquiry. Delegate Gilbert. How many uh, votes are ultimately required to uh, pass this bill? Eighty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed? The bill is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. House Bill 1490, a bill to repeal sections 2045.2 and 2045.3 of the Code of Virginia relating to same-sex marriages, civil unions, reported from courts of justice. Delegate from Virginia Beach, Delegate Guy. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members of the House. This bill simply repeals the statute that prohibits same-sex marriage and the statute that prohibits same-sex civil unions. As the members doubtless know, in 2015, the United States Supreme Court in Obersfell versus Hodges ruled such statutes unconstitutional as a violation of the due process and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. I believe it is part of our responsibility as legislators not to just continuously add to the Code of Virginia, but also to subtract those laws that are archaic and unconstitutional. I therefore ask the body to engross this bill and pass it to its third reading. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed? The bill is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. House Bill 1530, a bill to amend and reenact sections 2099 and 2106 of the Code of Virginia relating to no-fault divorces, corroboration required, reported from courts of justice. The delegate from Arlington, Delegate Hope. Thank you, Madam Speaker, members of the body. House Bill 1530 uh, would end the, no, the corroboration required for no-fault divorces. Arkansas and South Carolina and Virginia are the only other states that require third-party corroboration on no-fault divorces. Most of the requirements for a third-party uh, requirement require a witness affidavit. And if you look on line, starting on line 75 down to line 87, that's the language that we're striking. Uh, most of these questions that are being required in the affidavit to a no-fault divorce or would even be excluded under evidentiary rules. Uh, one of the questions is that the wife is not known to be pregnant from the marriage. Uh, the witness may not even know the wife. That the parties were married on a certain date, regardless of whether the witness even knew the parties at the time. That the witness has personal knowledge that the parties have not cohabitated since the date of separation. And of course, it's impossible for a third party to even know this. That the witness has personal knowledge that has been either the party's intention since the date to remain separate and apart permanently. Again, something that's impossible to know what another person's intentions have been. And then finally, that the children were or weren't born or adopted of the marriage. Uh, the witness might have never even met the party's children. So it will be a pleasure of the body to engross the bill and pass it on to its third reading. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its Madam third Speaker, reading? Yes, I've Delegate got a request to speak, but, but no one. Delegate Lindsay. Speaking to the measure. Delegate Lindsay, you have the floor. Uh, well, well, and and I've, this is not a surprise to the patron. I've told him that, that I have strong objection to, to his bill, and, and, I, and I don't think it's well founded. And I come at this both from a legal standpoint and a public policy standpoint. As, as we look at this bill, and, and this is a, an area of the law that I practice, and, and, I, and my understanding is a little bit different than that which what the gentleman has explained. If you think about how many times a married couple have some kind of rift and one or the other immediately thinks about getting a divorce, 
We're opening the floodgates, and we're, and we're making it very easy for people to make rash decisions at times of, of emotional trauma. When the process as it is puts forth a situation where there's measured response to a circumstance and a determination that is not set up to motivate someone to lie or to, to misrepresent in order to speed the clock, as it were. Right now, the, the law in Virginia says that if you're seeking a no-fault divorce and you have no children and you have a separation agreement, the two parties can get a divorce after a six-month separation. If those parties don't have a separation agreement but, but seek to get a divorce you know, or, or they have children, then it's a 12-month clock that's running from the time of separation. As to the questions that have been made reference to that come up in the, the Oritanus review by the judge, you know, questions typically are, did one, you know, do you know these parties? Uh, you know, is it your understanding that they've been separated? And many times you have persons testifying who are family members, children of the, of the marriage or, 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 or relatives who know if the people are living in the same house or living in separate houses. While, while arguably people can come and, and commit fraud upon the court, it's far easier when the person who has the most to gain in, in speeding up the clock is left to their own devices and the, how they, how they uh, speak in terms of the issue of truthfulness. I believe that this measure is going to be problematic. I believe it's going to open the floodgates to, to fraud upon the court. And I believe that the system as it's been, been in place is, is a valued system that has value and worth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Delegate from Newport News, Delegate Mullen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Speaking to the measure. Delegate Mullen, you have the floor. Uh, so just to be clear, uh, as someone who has practiced this type of law for a number of years in different settings, what we are doing here with this bill is removing the primary barrier we have to someone defrauding the court during a divorce. We want to make sure that someone is not misleading or misrepresenting to others that they've been separated for the appropriate amount of time, that they have separated their finances, or that they don't currently have an additional child in common who has not been previously mentioned. This is the primary way that we prevent fraud on the court during the course of a uncontested divorce proceeding. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Delegate from Scott, Delegate Kilgore. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen of the House, I rise to speak in favor of the bill. Uh, this bill is uh, a good bill in that it uh, already you can get a divorce by filing affidavits if you wanted to, by filing an affidavit. And most of the time, and I've done this work in the past, folks come into the office and swear and then they look at each other and say, is that date right? Is that date wrong? And, and that's the way it works out. This is just uh, uh, something that, uh, uh, you know, needs to be done. It's something that can uh, get the process uh, moving. And it's also, I would say, uh, when the uh, attorney and the actual witness, uh, the uh, complaining witness is there, they raise their hand under oath. They're still subject to the uh, penalties of perjury. So I say this is a good bill. It's uh, a cost-saving bill. It gets people into the office. And, and in most of these cases already you have, in all these cases, you already have a separation agreement. You are, the parties have already agreed in these type of uh, situations. Otherwise, they'd be going through a full-fledged divorce. So I, this is a good bill. Nothing, uh, nothing wrong with this bill. I hope you'll uh, engross this bill and pass it on to its third reading. Delegate from Chesapeake, Delegate Lefwich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, speaking to the measure. Delegate Lefwich, you have the floor. I'd like to associate my, my comments with the delegate from Newport News and the delegate from Norfolk. I also practice a great deal of law in this area and uh, don't think that those two individuals could have stated the opposition to this bill any better, but I would add that there's a fundamental principle in domestic relations that no matter can be deemed confessed. In other words, when you file for divorce, if someone does not respond, you cannot get a divorce or take any of their property by default. And the way they ensure that is to have cooperation, cooperation that they have been separated, that they were married on a certain date, that they have certain interests in marital property. And if you do away with the affidavit, you're taking away that cooperation and you're allowing people to get divorce judgments by default, okay? And there's a very fundamental reason why we don't allow that. So people cannot be robbed of their property and their marital rights. And I ask the body to deny engrossment of this bill. Delegate from Smith, Delegate Campbell. 
Madam Speaker, I, I rise to ask the patron a question. I yield. Will the delegate yield? I yield. Delegate yields. Delegate Campbell. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, I would ask the delegate, is he aware that the code actually allows a party, an interested party, to reopen uh, a case uh, premised upon fraud for up to two years? Uh, it, is he aware of that? Yeah. Well, the gentleman's informing me of it, so yeah, <laughs> th therefore, yes, I am. Uh, Follow-up question, uh, Madam Speaker. Another question. Will the delegate yield? I yield. Delegate yields. Delegate. I, I would ask the delegate: would, would that alleviate any concerns in your mind uh, about the possibility of fraud uh, being perpetrated upon the court by parties? Madam Speaker, I would tell the gentleman no, no that it doesn't. What we're trying to do is is take a look at the code, the aspects that are frankly impossible to have knowledge of, and just taking them out of the code. And I wish the people that were speaking to this bill actually were reading the bill because we're striking the language that aren't very clear. It's it's not the people that have personal knowledge of of things like that the wife is not known to be pregnant, how can someone have personal knowledge to absolutely know that? That the witness has personal knowledge that the par parties have not cohabitated. Unless you're with the couple every second of the day, how can you possibly know that? So no, that doesn't give me any comfort, Delegate. Delegate from Powhatan, Delegate Ware. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise for a motion. Delegate Ware. <laughs> I move the pending question. All, the, all those in favor of the pending question? All those opposed? Move the pending question. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor? Say aye. All those opposed? The bill is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. House Bill 1598, a bill to amend and reenact Section 10.1413 of the Code of Virginia relating to James State Scenic River, reported from Agriculture, Chesapeake, and Natural Resources. The delegate from Campbell, Delegate Ferris. Yes, ma'am. I, I really appreciate the uh, delegate from Powertown getting to this important bill. Uh, Madam Speaker, House Bill 1598, just... Uh, talks about 20 miles of the uh, James River. I don't know how we missed this in the past, but 20 miles of the James River is not part of the uh, Scenic River Act and designation, and that touches uh, Albemarle, Buckingham, and Fluvanna counties. Uh, I hope it would be the uh, pleasure of the body to engross this bill and send it to its third reading. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor say aye. All those opposed? The bill is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. House Bill 1601, a bill to amend and reenact Section 10.1418 of the Code of Virginia relating to Stanton State Scenic River, reported from Agriculture, Chesapeake, and Natural Resources. The delegate from Halifax, Delegate Edmonds. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, House Bill 1601 simply extends that section of the Stanton River from Route 761 at the Long Island Bridge to the Stanton River State Park to be designated as a scenic river. Madam Speaker, I move that House Bill 1601 be engrossed and passed on to its third reading. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed, the bill is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. House Bill 1612, a bill to amend the Code of Virginia by adding a section number 10.1411.5 relating to scenic rivers, Grays Creek in Surrey County, reported from Agriculture, Chesapeake, and Natural Resources. The delegate from Suffolk, Delegate Brewer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, House Bill 1612 would grant scenic river designation to the Grays Creek in Surrey County, and I hope it will be a pleasure of this body to engross the bill and pass it on to its third reading. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed, the bill will be, is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. Returning to page 31, House Bill 999, a bill to amend and reenact section 22.1274.2 of the Code of Virginia relating to school board policies, epinephrine, accessibility, reported from education. Delegate from Albemarle, Delegate Bell. Madam Speaker, member of the body, 
Current law allows a school to stock and for school nurses to administer epinephrine, the popularly known as the EpiPen. This would say that there always has to be someone at the school who can administer the EpiPen and someone who's available to unlock any locks that may be kept under locker. Hopefully, the pleasure of the House to engross the bill, pass it on to a third reading. Shall the bill be engrossed and passed on to its third reading? All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed, the bill is engrossed and passed on to its third reading. Resolutions on regular calendar. Senate Joint Resolution Number 1, ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, reported from Privileges and Elections. Delegate from Prince William, Delegate Carol Foy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Speaking to the resolution. Delegate Carol Foy, you have the floor. So this is it. This is the day that Virginia becomes the 38th and final state needed to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment into the United States Constitution. <laughs> Standing here today, I know the shoulders of the giants that I stand on. The people who came before me fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment for decades. To all of you, I say thank you. Thank you to the women and men who have agitated for equality, disrupted the status quo, and fought fearlessly for change. I, along with 160 million women and girls across this nation, your mothers, your daughters, we say thank you. Equality of, of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. These 24 words will be the 28th Amendment to the United States Constitution. So our rights can't be abrogated, our freedom cannot be stripped away, or our fate will not be dependent upon an election. This year celebrates the 100th year anniversary of women's right to vote. And I implore all of you today, right now, vote for women's constitutional equality. ERA now and equal rights for women forever. Thank you. I move to, for the, for the vote of this resolution. Shall the resolution, <laughs> shall the resolution be agreed to? The, cl the clerk shall close the roll. Ayes 58, nays 40, abstentions 0. Ayes 58, nays 40, abstention 0. The resolution passes. Memorial resolutions. The resolutions to be adopted in block are listed on pages 36 and 37 of the calendar. Does any member desire to remove a resolution from the block? Madam Speaker. Yes, delegate from Newport News, Delegate Mullen. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I would move that HJ4, my uh, House resolution involving and celebrating the life of Alan Diamondstein, be gone by for the day. I do. HJ4, Delegate Mullins, resolution will go by for the day. Shall HJ4, Delegate Mullen, resolution in memory of Alan Diamondstein go by for the day. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? The resolution goes by for the day. All those in favor of adopting and block the memorial resolutions laid on the speaker's table listed on pages 36 and 37 of the calendar with the exception of HJ4 shall rise. The resolutions are agreed to. Commending resolutions. The resolutions to be adopted in block are listed on pages 37 through 39 of the calendar. Does any member desire to remove a resolution from the block? Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting and block the commending resolutions laid on the speaker's table as listed on pages 37 to 39 of the calendar will say aye. aye. Those opposed? The resolutions are agreed to. Madam Speaker, that completes the calendar. Per House Rule 51, the House is returned to morning hour. Does the clerk have any additional announcements or communications? Meeting announcements for Monday, January 27th. Courts of Justice Committee will meet immediately upon adjournment of the House in House Room 3. That's a change in time, immediately upon adjournment of the House. Courts of Justice Criminals Subcommittee meets immediately upon adjournment of the full committee in House Room 3. Courts of Justice Civil Committee, Civil Subcommittee, immediately upon adjournment of full committee, House Room 1. Appropriations Committee meets one half hour after. Madam Speaker? Yes, Chairman Madam Torian. Speaker, uh, change in time. The Appropriations Committee will meet 15 minutes upon adjournment. Appropriations Committee will meet one, 15 minutes after adjournment of the House. Shared Committee Room. Appropriations Transportation and Public Safety Subcommittee will meet immediately upon adjournment of the full committee. Appropriations Higher Ed Subcommittee has been canceled. Agriculture Chesapeake and Natural Resources Chesapeake Subcommittee meets at 4 p.m. 300A Subcommittee Room. Education Pre-K through 12 Subcommittee meets 4 p.m. House Committee Room. Transportation Motor Vehicles Subcommittee will meet at 5 p.m. This is a change in time. 5 p.m. 400A Subcommittee Room. Privileges and Elections Constitutional Amendments Subcommittee meets at 4.30 p.m. House Room 1. That's a change in location. House Room 1. Northern Virginia Delegation Caucus, 5 p.m. 6th Floor Senate Leadership Conference Room. Meetings for January 28th. Tuesday, Privileges and Elections, Elections Subcommittee meets at 7 a.m. House Room 1. That's a change in time, 7 a.m. The Conservative Caucus meets at 7.30 a.m. 200B Subcommittee Room. Labor Caucus meets at 7.30 a.m. 300B Subcommittee Room. Press Conference on HB 658, Independent Commission to Investigate the Virginia Beach Mass Shooting, 7.45 a.m. House Briefing Room. Health, Welfare, and Institutions Committee meets at 8 a.m. House Committee Room. Animal Welfare Caucus meets at 8 a.m. 200B Subcommittee Room. Press Conference on Healthy Market Virginia Coalition meets at 8.15 a.m. House Briefing Room. Public Safety Firearms Subcommittee meets at 8.30 a.m. 300A Subcommittee Room. Press Conference to introduce the Community Coalitions of Virgi VA, CCOVA, Substance Abuse Prevention Group meets at 8.45 a.m. House Briefing Room. 
Transportation Committee meets at 9 a.m., House Room 3. Press Conference, Paid Family Medical Leave, 10 a.m., House Briefing Room. Press Conference, Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights, 10.30 a.m., House Briefing Room. Democratic Caucus, 11 a.m., House Room 1. Republican Caucus, 11 a.m., House Room 2. Delegate from Alexandria, Delegate Herring. Madam Speaker, I move when the House adjourns today, adjourn to reconvene at 12 noon. The Delegate from Alexandria, Delegate Herring moves that when the House do now adjourn, adjourn to reconvene tomorrow at 12 o'clock noon. As many as favor the motion, say aye. Aye. Uh, as many as opposed, say no. The motion's agreed to. Delegate Herring. Madam Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. The delegate from Alexandria, Delegate Herring, moves that the House do now adjourn. As many as favor the motion will say aye. aye. Those opposed? No. The motion is agreed to. The House stands adjourned until tomorrow, 12 o'clock noon. <laughs>